Well, welcome back to our course, Computer Organization and Architecture. We're continuing on in this uh, fourth major section, and we're going to be talking about instruction sets, addressing modes and formats. And so just to give you a sense, last time we talked about instruction sets, but we're focusing on the characteristics and functions. And this time we're trying to focus on the addressing modes and formats. So this is complicated enough that we needed to divide it up. And so um, in terms of the things that we're going to cover for, for this lecture, as we typically do, we first go through um, a, a summary, uh, kind of a prelude, go through the details and then come back and do this um, as a summary fashion just to see what we, what we talked about. So first we'll be talking about addressing modes. And so with assembly language, there's all kinds of different modes that can be done, immediate, direct, indirect, register, register indirect, displacement, and stack. And so we're gonna get a chance to get familiar with each one of those. We'll think about this both from the x86 and the ARM point of view. We'll talk about the instruction formats, the, the lengths, the allocation of bits and the variable length instructions, which is true for x86. We'll talk about the x86 and in instruction formats and finally the ARM instruction formats. So the address fields or the address field or fields in a typical instruction format are relatively small. We would like to be able to reference a large range of locations in main memory or for some systems, virtual memory. To achieve this objective, a variety of addressing techniques have been employed. They all involve some trade-off between uh, address range and or uh, addressing flexibility on the one hand and the number of memory references in the instruction and or the complexity of addressing calculations on the other. In this section, we examine the most common addressing techniques or modes, which are immediate, direct, indirect, register, register indirect, displacement, and stack. So we'll talk about those one at a time. These modes are illustrated in figure 14.1, and so that's what we're showing here. Um, in this section, we use the following notation, A equals contents of the address field and the instruction, R equals content of the address field and the instruction that refers to a register, EA um, stands for actual, um, parenthetically effective, so effective actual address of the location containing the reference operand um, in parentheses X is the contents of memory location X or register X. So we're gonna have seven different types of things that we're going to be focusing on. Table 14.1 indicates the address calculation performed for each addressing mode. Before beginning this discussion, the, the, the two, comments, two comments need to be made. First, virtually all computer architectures provide more than one of these ad address modes. Um, the, the question arises as to how the pr processor can determine which address mode is being used. In, in a particular instruction. Several approaches are, are taken. Often different opcodes will be, will use different addressing modes. Also one or more bits in the instruction format can be used as a mode field. The value of the mode field determines which addressing mode is to be used. The second comment concerns the interpretation of the effective address, EA. In a system without virtual memory, the effective address will be either a main memory address or a register. In a virtual memory system, the effective address is a virtual address or a register. The actual mapping to a physical address is a function of the memory management unit, MMU, and is invisible to the programmer. The simplest form of addressing is immediate addressing in which the operand value is present in the instruction, so operand equals A. This mode can be used to define and use constants or set initial values of variables. Typically, 
The number will be stored in two's complement form. The, the leftmost bit of the operand field is used as a sign bit. When the operand is loaded into a data register, the, the sign bit is extended to the left to the, to the full data word size. In some cases, the immediate binary value is interpreted as an unsigned non-negative integer. The advantage of immediate addressing is that no memory reference other than the instruction fetch is required to obtain the operand, thus saving one memory or cache cycle in the instruction cycle. The disadvantage is that the, the size of the number is, is restricted to the size of the address field, which in most instruction sets is small compared with the word length. A very simple form of addressing is direct addressing in which the address field contains the, the effective address of the operand, e a equals a. The technique was common in early, earlier generations of computers, but is not co uh, common on contemporary architectures. It requires only one memory reference and no special calculations. The obvious limitation is that it provides only a limited address space. When direct address with a direct addressing, the length of the address field is usually less than the word length, thus limiting the address range. One solution is to have the address field refer to the address of a word in memory, which in turn can, contains a full length address of the operand. This is known as indirect addressing. So that would be of the form EA equals in parentheses A. As defined earlier, the parentheses are to be interpreted as meaning contents of. The obvious advantage of this approach is that a word length of N um, an address space of two to the N is now available. The disadvantage is that the instruction execution requires two memory references to fetch the operand, one to get its address and a second to get its value. Although the number of words that can be addressed is now equal to two to the n, the number of different effective addresses that may be referenced at any one time is limited to two to the k, where k is the length of the address field. Typically, this is not a burdensome restriction and it can be, a, be an asset. In a virtual memory environment, all the effective address locations can be confined to page zero of, of any process. Because the address field of an instruction is small, it will naturally produce low numbered direct addresses, which would appear in page zero. It's only, the only restriction is that the page size must be graded or equal to two to the K. When a process is active, there will be repeated references to page zero, causing it to remain in real memory. Thus, an indirect memory reference will involve, at most, one page fault rather than two. A rarely used variant of indirect addressing is multi-level or cascade indirect addressing, which looks like EA equals parentheses and then inside of that, another parentheses for A. In this case, one bit of the full word address is an indirect flag I if the, I, uh, if the I bit is zero, then the word contains the EA. If the I bit is one, then another level of indirection is invokes, so double indirection. There does not appear to be any particular advantage to this approach and its disadvantage is that three or more memory references could be required to fetch an operand. For register addressing, it is similar to direct addressing. The only difference is that the address field refers to a register rather than a main memory address. So EA is equal to R. Clarify if the contents of the register address field is an instruction is an instruction is five, then the register R5 is the intended address and the operand value is contained in R5. Typically an address field that references registers will have from three to five bits. So a total from eight to 32 general purpose registers can be references. Reference, 
The advantage of register addressing are that one, only a small address field is needed in the instruction and two, no time consuming, consuming memory references are required. As was discussed in chapter five, the memory access time for a register internal to the processor is much less than that for a main memory address. The disadvantage of register addressing is that the address space is very limited. If register addressing is heavily used in an instruction set, this implies that the processor registers will be hev heavily used. Because of the, the, the severely limited number of registers, which is common among main memory locations, as compared with uh, main memory locations, sorry, their use in this fashion makes sense only if, there are, if they are employed efficiently. efficiently. If every operand is brought into a register from main memory, operated on once and then returned to main memory, then a, a wasteful intermediate step has been added. If instead the operand in a register remains in use for multiple operations, then a real savings is achieved. An example is the intermediate result in a calculation. In particular, suppose the algorithm for two's complement multiplication were to be implemented in software. The location labeled A in the flowchart, so that's in figure 11.2, 11.12, in case you want to look it up, is referenced many times it should be implemented in a, in a register rather than a main memory. It is up to the programmer or compiler to decide which value which values should remain in the registers and which should be stored in main memory. Most modern processors employ multiple general purpose registers, placing a burden for efficient execution on the assembly language programmer, that is the, the compiler writer. So for register indirect addressing, just as a register addressing is an analogous to direct addressing, register indirect addressing is analogous to indirect addressing. In both cases, the only difference is whether the address field refers to a memory location or a register. Thus, for register indirect, it would be EA equals parentheses R. The advantages and limitations of register indirect addressing are basically the same as for the indirect addressing. In both cases, the address space limitation, that is the, the limited range of addresses of the address field is overcome by having the field referred to a word length location contain, containing an address. In addition, register indirect addressing uses one less memory reference than indirect addressing. Next, um, displacement addressing. A very powerful mode of addressing combines the capabilities of direct addressing and register indirect addressing. It is known as a, by a variety of names depending on the contents of its use, but the basic mechanism is the same. We will refer to this as displacement addressing. And it can be shown as EA equals A plus parentheses R. Displacement addressing requires that the instruction have two address fields, at least one of which is explicit. The value contains one address field that which has the value equals A, and this and what we're showing here uh, um, is used indirectly. The only address field or implicit reference based on opcode refers to a register whose contents are added to A to produce the, uh, the effective address. We will describe three of the most common uses of displacement addressing. First is relative addressing. Second is base register addressing. And three is indexing. So for relative addressing, which is also called PC relative addressing, the implicitly um, reference register is the program counter PC. That is, the next instruction address is added to the address field to produce the EA. Typically, the address field is treated as two's complement number for this operation. Thus, the effective address is a displacement relative to the address of the instruction. 
relative addressing exploits the concept of locality that was discussed in chapter four and nine. If most memory references are relative, relatively near to the instruction being executed, then the use of relative addressing saves address bits in the instruction. Next is base register addressing. For base register addressing, the interpretation is as follows. The reference um, register contains a main memory address and the address field contains a displacement, usually an unsigned integer representation from that address. The register reference may be explicit or implicit. Base register addressing also exploits the locality of memory references. It is con convenient it is a convenience means of implementing segmentation, which was discussed in chapter nine. In some implementations, a single segment based register is employed and is used implicitly. In others, the programmer may choose a register to hold of the base address of the segment and the instruction must reference it explicitly. In this latter case, if the length of the address field is K and the number of possible registers is, is N, then the, the instructions can reference any of the, any one of the N areas of two to the K words. Next, we have indexing. And so for indexing, the interpretation is typically as follows. The address field references a main memory location and the reference register contains a positive displacement from that, image, from that address. Note that this usage is just the opposite of the interpretation for base register addressing. Of course, it is more than just a matter of user interpretation. Because the address field is, is considered to be a memory address in indexing, it generally contains more bits than an address field in a comparable base register instruction. Also, we shall see that there are some refinements to indexing that would not be useful in the base register context. Nevertheless, the method of calculating the EA is the same for both base register addressing and indexing. And in both cases, the register reference is sometimes explicit and sometimes implicit that is for different processor types. An important use of indexing is to provide an efficient mechanism for performing uh, iterative operations. Consider, for example, a list of numbers stored starting at location A. Suppose that we would like to add one to each element on the list. We need to fetch each value, add one to it, and store it back. The sequence of effective addressing that, that we need is A, A plus one, A plus two, and so forth, up to the last location on the list. The indexing, with index, indexing, this is easily done. The value A is stored in the instructions uh, address field and the chosen register called an index register is in, initialized to zero. After each operation, the index register is incremented by one. Because index registers are commonly used for such iterative tasks, it is typical that there is a need to increment or decrement the index register after each reference to it. Because this is such a common operation, some systems will automatically do this as part of the, the, the same instruction cycle. This is known as auto-indexing. If certain registers are devoted exclusively to indexing, then auto-indexing can be invoked implicitly and automatically. If general purpose registers are used, the auto indexing operation may need to be si si signaled by a bit in the instructions. In some machines, both indirect indexing and indexing are provided and it is possible to employ both in the same instruction. There are two possibilities. Indexing is performed either before or after the indirection. If indexing is performed after the indirection is termed post-indexing. First, the, the content of the address field are, are used to access a memory location containing a direct address. This address is then indexed by the, the register value. 
This technique is useful for, for accessing one of a number of blocks of data of a fixed format. For example, it was described in chapter eight that the operation, operating system needs to employ a process control block for each process. The operations performed are the same regarding, regardless of the block being manipulated. Thus, the address is the instruction that references the block could point to a location such as value equals A, containing a, a variable pointer to the start of the process control block. The index register contains the displacement within the block. With pre-indexing, the index is performed before the indirection. An address is calculated as with simple indexing. In this case, however, the calculated address contains not the operand, but the address of the operand. An example of the use of this technique is to construct a multi-way branch table at a particular point in a program, there may be a branch to one of the number of locations depending on uh, conditions. A table of addresses can be set up for starting at location A. By indexing into the table, the, the required location can be found. Typically, instruction set will not include both pre-indexing and post-indexing. And finally, we have stack addressing. The, the final addressing mode that we're considering here is stack addressing as defined in Appendix E. A stack is a linear array of location. It is sometimes referred to as a push down list or last in first out queue. The stack is a reverse block of locations. Items are appended to the top of the stack so that at any given Time, the block is partially filled. Associated with the stack is a pointer whose value is the address of the top of the stack. Alternatively, the, the top two elements of the stack may be in processor registers, in which case the stack pointer references the third element of the stack. The stack pointer is maintained in a register. Thus, references to the stack location in, in memory are in fact register indirect addresses. The stack mode of addressing is a form of implied addressing. The machine instruction need not include a memory reference, but implicitly operate on the top of the stack. So here's a illustration of the x86 addressing mode calculation. So recall from figure 921, so you can go back to chapter nine and look at that if you'd like, that the x86 address translation mechanism produces an address called a virtual or effective address that is an offset into a segment. The sum of the starting address of the segment and the effective address produces a linear address. If paging is being used, the linear address must pass through a page transition mechanism to produce a physical address. In what follows, we ignore this last step because it is transparent to the instruction set and to the programmer. The x86 is equipped with a variety of addressing modes intended to allow the efficient execution of high-level languages. Figure 14.2, which we're showing here, indicates a logic involved. The segment register determines the, the, the segment that is the subject of the reference. There are six segment registers, the one being used for a particular reference depends on the content of execution and the instruction. Each segment register holds an index into the segment des descriptor table, which is shown in figure 920, if you want to go back and look at that which holds a starting address of the corresponding segments. Associated with each user visible segment register is, is a segment descriptor register, not program, program, programmer visible though, which records the access rights for the, the sequence as well as the starting address and limit, that is the length of the segment. In addition, there are two registers that may be used in, con in constructing an address, the base register and the index register. 
Table 4.2 lists the x86 addressing modes. And so let us consider each of them in turn. So for an immediate mode, the operand is included in the instruction. The operand can be a byte, a word, or a double word of data. For register operand mode, the operand is located in a register. For general instructions, such as the data transfer, uh, arithmetic, and logical instructions, the operands can be one of the 32-bit general registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, ESI, EDI, ESP, and EB, EBP. One of the 16-bit general registers, AX, BX, CX, DX, SI, DI, SP, and BP, or one of the 8-bit general registers, AH, BH, CH, DH, AL, BL, CL, and DL. There are also some instructions that reference the segment selector registers CS, DS, ES, SS, FS, and GS. The remaining address modes reference locations in memory. The memory location must be specified in terms of the segment containing the location and the offset from the beginning of the segment. In some cases, a segment is specified explicitly, and others, a segment is specified by simple rules that assign a segment by default. In a displacement mode, the operand offset, the effective address of figure 14.2, is contained as part of the instruction as an 8, 16, or 32-bit displacement. With segment, segmentation, all addresses and instructions may refer merely to an offset in a segment. The displacement address mode is found on a few machines because, as mentioned earlier, it leads to long instructions. In the case of the x86, the displacement value can be as long as 32 bits, making for six bytes of instructions. Displacement addressing can be useful for referencing global variables. The main, remaining addressing modes are indirect in the sense that, they, the, in, that the address portion of, of the instruction tells the processor where to look to find the address. The base mode specifies though that one of the eight, 16 or 32 bit registers contains the effective address. This is equivalent to what we have referred to in, in, as register indirect addressing. In the, in the base with it displacement mode, the instructions, instruction includes a displacement to be added to a base register, which may be any of the general purpose registers. Examples of use of this mode are as follows. It's used by a compiler to point to a start of a local variable area. For example, the base register could point to the beginning of a stack frame, which contains a local variable for the corresponding procedure. It's used to index, um, this is number two, it's used to index into an array when the element size is not one, two, four, or eight bytes, and which therefore cannot be indexed using an index register. In this case, the displacement points to the beginning of the array and the base register holds the results of the calculation to determine the offset to a specific element within the array. And number three, um, you, it's used to access a field of, of record. The, the base register points to a beginning of the record while the displacement is an offset to the field. In the, the scaled index with displacement mode, the instruction includes a displacement to be added to a register, in this case called an index register. The index register may be any of the general purpose registers except the one called ESP, which is generally used for stack processing. In calculating the effect of addressing, the contents of the index register are multiplied by a scalar factor of one, two, four, or eight, and then added to a displacement. This mode is very convenient for indexing arrays. A, a scaling factor of two can be used for an array of 16-bit integers. 
A scaling factor of four can be used for 32-bit integers or floating point numbers. Finally, a scaling factor of eight can be used for any or for an array of double precision floating point numbers. The, the base with index and displacement mode sums the contents of the base register, the index register, and the displacement to form the uh, effective address. Again, the base register can be any general purpose register, and the index register can be any general purpose register except ESP. As an example, this address mode could be used for accessing a local array on a stacked frame. This mode can also be used to support a two-dimensional array. In this case, the displacement points to the beginning of the array, and each register handles one dimension of the array. The base scaled index with displacement mode sums the contents of the index register multiplied by a scaling, scaling factor. The contents of the base register and the displacement. This is useful in an array, if an array is stored as a stack frame, in this case, the array element would be two, four, or eight bytes in length. This mode also provides an efficient indexing of two dimensional arrays when the array elements are two, four, or eight bytes in length. Finally, relative addressing can be used in transfer of control instructions. A displacement is added to the value of the program counter, which points to the next instruction. In this case, the displacement is treated as a sign byte word or double word value, and the value either increases or decreases the address in the program counter. Load and store instructions are the only instructions that reference memory. This is always done indirectly through a base register plus offset. There are three alternative alternatives with respect to indexing that's shown in figure 14.3, which we're showing here. First, there's the offset for, for this addressing method. Indexing is not used. An offset value is added to or subtracted from the value in the base register to form the memory address. As an example, figure 14.3a illustrates this method with a assembly language instruction um, strb r0 comma um, parentheses r1 um, hash 12. And so you can see that up here at the very top. This is the store byte instruction. In this case, the base address is the register r1 and the displacement is the immediate value of of decimal 12. Um, the resulting address base plus offset is a location where the, the least significant byte from R0 is to be stored. Next, we have pre-index uh, index. Um, the memory address is formed in the same way as for, as for offset addressing. The, the memory address is also written back to the base register. In other words, the base register value is incremented or decremented by the offset value. Figure 14.3b illustrates this method with the assembly instruction that we're showing here, strb r0, r1, pound 12. Um, the, the, ex, exclam, the exclamation point signifies pre-indexing. And so that's what we have here at the very end of the instruction. Finally, we have post-indexing. And um, the memory address is the base register value. An offset is added to, to or subtracted from the base register value. And the result is written back to the base register. Figure 14.3c illustrates this method uses the uh, um, assembly language instruction, what we're showing here, RTRB, R0, comma, parentheses R1, pound 12. Note that the ARM um, refers to as a base register acts as an index register for pre-index and post-index addressing. The offset value can either be an immediate value stored in the instruction or it can be another register. 
if the asset value is a in a register, another useful feature is uh, available, scaled register addressing. The value in the offset register is scaled by one of the shift operators, log logical shift left, logical shift right, arithmetic shift right, rotate right, or rotate, rotate right extended, which includes the carry bit in, in the rotation. The amount of the shift is specified as an immediate value in the instruction. Okay, continue on with the ARM for ARM data processing instruction addressing the branch instructions. Data processing instructions use either register addressing or, or a mixture of register and immediate addressing. For register addressing, the value in one of the register operands may be scaled using one of the five ship op operators defined in the preceding paragraph that we talked about Pre preceding material that we talked about in the last chart. The only form of addressing for branch instructions is immediate addressing. The branch instruction contains a 24-bit value. For address calculations, this value is a shift left two bits so that the address is on a word boundary. Thus, the effective address range is plus or minus 20, um, 32 megabyte from the program counter. Here we have an ARM load and store multiple addressing. Mul load multiple uh, instructions load a subsequent, um, possibly all of the general purpose registers from, from memory. Store multiple instructions, store a subset, again, possibly all of the, the general purpose registers to memory. memory. The list of registers for the load or store is, is specified in a 16-bit field in the instruction with each bit corresponding to one of the 16 registers. Load and store multiply addressing modes produce a sequential range of memory addresses. The lowest number numbered register is stored at the lowest memory address and the highest numbered register at the highest memory address. Four addressing modes are used. So that's what we're showing here in figure 14.4. Increment after, increment before, decrement after, and decrement before. A base register specifies a main memory address where register values are stored in or loaded from an ascending, that is incrementing or descending, that is decrement word locations. Incrementing or decrementing starts either before or after the first memory access. These instructions are useful for block loads or stores, stack operations, and procedure exit sequences. An instruction format defines a layout of the bits of an instruction in terms of its constituent fields. An instruction format must include an opcode and implicitly or explicitly zero or more operands. Each explicit operand is referenced using one of the addressing modes described in section 14.1. The format must implicitly or explicitly indicate the addressing mode for each operand. For most instruction sets, more than one instruction format is used. The design of an instruction format is a complex art and an amazing variety of designs have been implemented. We examine the key design issues, looking briefly at some designs to illustrate points. And then we examine the x86 and ARM solutions in detail. For instruction length, the most basic design issues to be faced is the instruction format length. The decision affects and is affected by memory size, memory organization, bus structure, processor complexity, and processor speed. The decision determines the richness and flexibility of the machine as seen by the assembly language programming. The most obvious trade-off here is between the desire for a powerful instruction repertoire and a need to save space. Programmers want more opcodes, more operands, more addressing modes, and greater address range. More opcodes and, and more operands make life easier for the programmer because 
shorter programs can be written to accomplish given tasks. Similarly, more addressing modes give the programmer greater flexibility in addressing certain functions such as table manipulation and multiple way branching. And of course, with the increase in main memory size and the increase, increasing use of virtual memory, programmers want to be able to address larger memory ranges. All of these things, opcodes, operands, addressing modes, and addressing range require bits and push in the direction of longer instruction lengths. But longer in instruction lengths may be wasteful. A 64-bit instruction uh, occupies twice the space of a 32-bit instruction, but is probably less than twice as useful. Beyond this basic trade-off, there are other considerations. Either the instruction length should be equal to the memory transfer length in a, in, a, in a bus system, data bus length, or one should be a multiple of the other. Otherwise, we will not get an, an integral number of instructions during a fetch cycle. A related consideration is the memory transfer rate. The rate has not kept up with increases in processor speed. Accordingly, memory can become a bottleneck if the processor can execute instruction faster than it can fetch them. One solution is to, is to this problem is the use of cache memory. So we talked about this in section 4.3. Another is a use of shorter instructions. Thus, a 16-bit instruction can be fetched at, at twice the rate of 32-bit instructions, but probably can be executed less than twice as rapidly. A seemingly mundane but nevertheless important feature is that the instruction length should be a multiple of the character length, which is usually eight bits, and of the length of fixed point numbers. To see this, we need to, to make use of that unfortunate ill-fated word, um, um, the, the word length of the memory is in some senses the quote natural unit of organization, the, the side of, Size of the word usually determines the, the size of a fixed point numbers, which is usually the, the two are equal. Word size is also typically equal to, or at least integrally related to the, the memory transfer size. Because a common form of data is character data, we would like a, a word to store in an in integral number of characters. Otherwise, there are wasted bits in each word when storing multiple characters, or a character will have to straddle a word boundary. The importance of this point is such that the IBM, when it introduced the System 360 and wanted to employ 8-bit characters, made the, the wretching decision to move the 36-bit the, the architectures of the scientific members of the 700, 7,000 series to a 32-bit architecture. Okay, let's now talk about allocations a bit. Let's let, we're, we're locked at, we, we've looked at, at some of the factors that go into deciding the length of the instruction format and equally difficult issue is how to allocate the bits in the format. The trade-off here are complex. For a given instruction length, there is clearly a trade-off between the number of opcodes and the power of the addressing capability. More opcodes obviously mean more bits in the opcode field. For an instruction format of a given length, the, the, this reduces the number of bits available for addressing. There is one interesting refinement to this trade-off. And that is the use of a variable length opcodes. In this approach, there is a minimum opcode length, but for some opcodes, additional op operations may be specified by using additional bits in the instruction. For a fixed length instruction, this leaves fewer bits for addressing. Thus, this feature is used for those instructions that require fewer operands or and or less powerful addressing. The following interrelated factors go into determining the, the use of the addressing bits. First, the, the number of addressing modes. Sometimes an, a, an addressing mode can be in, indicated implicitly. For example, certain opcodes might always 
call for indexing. In other cases, the addressing mode must be explicit and one or more modes of, of bits will be needed. Next thing, the number of operands. We have seen that fewer addressing can make for longer, more awkward programming. So an example would be from figure 13.3. Typical instruction formats on today's machines include two operands. Each operand address in the instruction might require its own mode indicator or the use of a mode indicator could be limited to just one of the address fields. Regi then we have register versus memory. A machine must have registers so that data can be brought into the processor for processing. With a single user visible register, usually called the accumulator, one operand address is implicit and consumes no instruction bits. However, single register programming is awkward and requires many instructions. Even with multiple registers, only a few bits are needed to specify the, the register. The more that registers can be used for operand references, the, the fewer bits are needed. A number of studies indicate that a total of eight to 32 user visible registers is desirable. Most contemporary architectures have at least 32 registers. Next, the number of register sets. Most contemporary machines have one set of general purpose registers with typically 32 or more registers in that set. These registers can be used to store data and can be used to store addresses for displacement addressing. Some architectures, include, including that of the x86, have a collection of two or more specialized sets, um, such as data and displacement. One advantage of this later approach is that for a fixed number of registers, a, a functional split requires fewer bits to be used in the instruction. For example, with two sets of eight registers, only three bits are required to identify a register. The opcode or, or mode register will determine which set of registers is to be referenced. Then we have address range for, for addresses that reference memories. The range of addresses that can be referenced is related to the number of address bits. Because this imposes a severe limitation, direct addressing is rarely used. With displacement addressing, the range is opened up to the, the length of the address register. Even so, it is, is still convenient to allow rather large displacements from the register address, which requires a relatively large number of address bits in the instructions. Finally, we have a address granularity for addr addresses that reference memory rather than registers. Another factor is the granularity of addressing. In a system with 16 or 32-bit words, an address can reference a, a word or a byte at the designator's choice. Byte addressing is con convenient for character manipulation, but requires for a fixed size memory more address bits. Thus, the designer is faced with a host of factors to consider and balance. How critical the, the various choices are is not clear. As an example, one study that compared various instruction formats approaches, in, including the, the use of the stack, general purpose registers, accumulator, and only memory to register approaches. So there's a quote in the, the textbook. You can look that up if you want to hear more about that. Using a consistent set of assumptions, no significant difference in code space or execution time was observed. From a historical sense, we can be looking here at the PDP-8 instruction formats. And this is um, one of the simplest instruction de designs for a general purpose computer was on the PDP-8. The PDP-8 uses 12-bit instructions and operates on 12-bit words. There is a single general purpose register, the accumulator. Despite the limitations of this design, the, the addressing is quite flexible. Each memory reference consists of seven bits plus one bit modifiers. The memory is divided into fixed length pages of two to the seventh is equals to 128 words each. 
address calculations is based on references to page zero or the, the current page, uh, just the, the page containing the instruction as determined by the page bit. The next modifier bit indicates whether direct or indirect addressing is to be used. These two modes can be used in combination so that an indirect address is a 12-bit address containing, containing a word of page zero or the, the current page. In addition, eight dedicated words on page zero are auto-index registers when an index reference is made to the to one of these locations pre-indexing occurs. Figure 14.5 shows the PDP-8 instruction format. And so that's what we're showing here. There are three bit opcodes and three types of instructions for opcode zero through five. The format is a single address memory reference instruction, including a page bit and an indirect bit. Thus, there are only six basic operations. To enlarge the, the group of operations, opcode op seven defines a register reference or micro instruction. In this format, the, the remaining bits are used to encode additional operations. In general, each bit defines a specific operation, for example, clear the accumulator. And these bits can be combined in a, in a single instruction. The microinstruction strategy was, was used as far back as the PDP-1 by DEC and is in, in a sense a forerunner of today's microprogram machines, uh, it, which was, will be discussed in part four as we come back, come to that later. Um, opcode six is the IO op operation. Six bits are used to select one of the 64 devices and three bits specify a particular IO command. The PDP instruction format is remarkably efficient, supports indirect addressing, displacement addressing, and indexing. With the use of the opcode extension, it supports a total of approximately 35 instructions. Given the constraints of a 12-bit instruction length, the designer could hardly have done better. So that's a, a useful example. Here we looking at the PDP-10 instruction format. A sharp contrast is the instruction set for the for, of the, the PDP-8 is the PDP-10. The PDP-10 was designed to be a large-scale time-shared system with an emphasis on making the system easy to program, even if the additional hardware expense was involved. And the, among the design principles employed in designing the, the instruction set were the following. First, orthogonality. Orthogonality is a principle by which two variables are independent of each other. In the contents of an instruction set, the, the term indicates that the other elements of an instruction are independent of that is not determined by the opcode. The PDP-10 designers use the term to describe the, the fact that the ad address is always computed in the, the same way, independent of the opcode. This is in contrast to many machines where the address mode sometimes depends implicitly on the operator being used. Um, completeness is another factor. Each arithmetic data type, integer, fixed point, and floating point should have a complete and identical set of operations. Then there's a direct addressing, base plus displacement addressing, which places a memory organization burden on the programmer was avoided in favor of direct addressing. Each of these principles ad advances the main goal of each of, of the programming. The PDP-10 had a 36-bit word length and a 36-bit instruction length. The fixed instruction format is shown in figure 14.6, which we're showing here. The opcode occupied nine bits, allowing up to 512 operations. In fact, a total of 365 different instructions were, are defined. Most instructions have two addresses, one of which is um, one of the 16 general purpose registers. Thus, the operand reference occupies four bits. The other operand refers reference starts with an 18-bit reference address field. This can be used as an immediate operation operand or 
a memory address. In the later usage, both indexing and indirect addressing are allowed. The same general purpose registers are also used in, in, as index registers. A 36-bit a instruction length is, is a true luxury. There is no need to do clever things to get more opcodes. A 9-bit opcode field is more than adequate. Addressing is also straightforward. An 18-bit address field makes direct addressing desirable. For memory sizes greater than 2 to the 18th, indirection is provided. For the ease of the programmer, indexing is provided for, for table manipulation and iterative programming. Also, with an 18-bit operand field, immediate addressing becomes attractive. The PDP-10 instruction set des design does not accomplish the objectives er listed earlier. It eases the task of the programmer or compiler at the expense of an inefficient utilization, utilization of space. This was a conscious choice made by the designers and, and therefore cannot be faulted as a poor design. So for variable length instructions, the examples we have looked at so far have used a single fixed in instruction length, and we have implicitly discussed trade-offs in that context. But the designers may choose instead to provide a variety of instruction formats of different lengths. This tactic makes it easy to provide a large repertoire of opcodes with different opcode lengths. Ad addressing can be more flexible with various combination of registers and memory references plus address, addressing modes. With variable length instruction, these many variations can be provided efficiently and compactly. The principal price to, to pay for variable length instruction is an increase in the complexity of a, the processor. Following hardware prices, which is the usual case for microprogramming, which is discussed in part four, and a general increase in understanding the principle of processor design have all contributed to making this a small price to pay. However, we will see that the risk and superscalar machines can exploit the use of the fixed length instruction to provide improved performance. The ARM uses fixed um, address space, a fixed um, um, instruction length versus a SIS, like what we're talking about the x86, it uses a variable, so keep that in mind. The use of the variable length instruction does not remove the desirability of making all of the instruction lengths integrally related to the word length. Because the, the processor does not know that the length of the, the next instruction to be fetched, a typical strategy is to fetch a number of bytes or, or words equal to at least the, the longest possible instruction. This means that sometimes multiple instructions are fetched. However, as we shall see in chapter 16, this is a good strategy to follow in any case. So the, the PDP-11 was designed to provide a, a powerful and flexible instruction set with the, the constraints of a 16-bit microcomputer. The PDP-11 employed a, a set of eight 16-bit general purpose registers, and so we're seeing that here. Two of these registers have an additional significance. One is used as a stack pointer for a special purpose stack operation, and one is used as a program counter, which contains the address of the next instruction. Figure 14.7, which we're showing here, shows the PDP-11 instruction format. 13 different formats are used, encompassing zero, one, and two address instruction types. The opcode can vary from four to 16 bits in length. Register references are six bits in length. Three bits identify the register and the remaining three bits identify the addressing mode. The PDP-11 is endowed with a rich set of addressing modes. One advantage of linking the address mode to the operands rather than the opcode is as is sometimes done, is that any addressing mode can be used with any opcode. As was mentioned, this independence is referred to as orthogonality. PDP-11 instructions are usually one word, uh, 16 bits long, 
for some instructions, one or two memory addresses are appended so that 32-bit and 48-bit instructions are part of the repertoire. This provides for further flexibility in addressing. The PDP-11 instruction set and addressing capability are complex. This in increases both hardware costs and programming um, complexity. The advantage is most uh, efficient or compact programs can be developed. So next, let's talk about the VAX instructions. Most architectures provide a relatively small number of fixed instruction formats. This can cause two problems for the programmer. First, addressing mode and opcode are not orthogonal. For example, for a given operation, one operand must come from a register and another from memory, or both from registers and so on. Second, only a limited number of operands can be accommodated, typically up to two or three, because some operations inherently require more operands, various strategies must be used to achieve the desired result using two or more instructions. To avoid these problems, two criteria must be used in de designing the, the VAX in, in, in instruction format. One, all instructions should have a, quote, natural number of operands, and two, all operands should have the, the same general, generality and specification. The result is a highly variable instruction format. An instruction consists of one or two byte opcodes followed by from zero to six operands specifiers, um, depending on the opcode. The minimum instruction length is one byte, and instructions up to 37 bytes can be constructed. Figure 14.8 gives a few examples. So the, the VAX instruction begins with a one byte opcode. This suffices to handle most VAX instructions. However, as there are over 300 different instructions, a eight bits are not enough. The hexadecimal code FD and FF indicate an extended opcode with the actual opcode being specified in the second byte. The remainder of the instruction consists of up to six operand specifiers. Uh, An operand specifier is at minimum one byte format in which the, the leftmost four bits are the uh, address mode specifier. The only exception to the rule is the literal mode, which is, is signaled by the pattern zero, zero to the leftmost two bits, leaving space for six bit literal. Because of this exception, a total of 12 different addressing modes can be specified. An operand specifier often consists of just one byte with the rightmost four bits specifying one of the, the 16 general purpose registers. The length of the oper operand specifier can be extended in one of two ways. First, a constant value of one or more bytes may immediately follow the, the first byte of the operand specifier. An example of this is the displacement mode in which an 8, 16, or 32-bit displacement is used. Second, an index mode of addressing may be used. In this case, the, the first byte of the operand specifier consists of the 4-bit addressing mode code 0100 and a 4-bit index register identifier. The remainder of the operand specifier consists of the, the base address specifier, which may itself be one or more bytes in length. The VAX instruc instruction set provides for a wide variety of operations and addressing modes. This gives a programmer such as a, a compiler writer a very powerful and flexible tool for developing programs. In theory, this should lead to efficient machine language comp compilation of high-level language programs and in general to affect uh, an efficient use of processor resources. The penalty to be paid for these benefits is the increased complexity of the processor compared with a processor with a simple instruction set and format. The x86 is equipped with a variety of instruction formats. Of the elements described in this, this subset section, only the opcode field is always present. Figure 14.9 illustrates the general instruction format. 
Um, the elements described in this subsection, only the opcode field is always present. As I said, figure 14.9 illustrates a general instruction format. Instructions are made up of from zero to four optional instruction prefixes, a one or two byte opcode, an optional address specifier, which consists of the, the mod RM byte and the scale index base byte, an optional displacement and an optional immediate field. So let us consider the, the prefix bytes. So the pre instruction prefixes, the instruction prefix, um, if present, consists of the lock pre prefix or one of the, the repeat prefixes. The lock prefix is used to ensure exclusive use of a shared memory in multiprocessor environments. The repeat prefixes specify repeats operations of a string, which enables the x86 to process string strings much faster than with a regular software loop. There are five different repeat prefixes, REP, REPE, REPZ, REPNE, and REPNZ. When the absolute REP prefix is present, the op operations spec specified in the instruction set is executed immediately on successive elements of the string, the number of the repetitions is specified in register, register CX, and the conditional REP prefix causes the instruction to repeat until the count in CX goes to zero or until the condition is met. Then there's a segment override. So we talked about the prefix, and now we're in the override. The segment override explicitly determines which segment register an instruction should use overriding the default segment register selection by the x86 for that instruction. Next, we have the operand size. An instruction has a default operand size of 16 or 32 bits, and the operand prefix switches between 32-bit and 16-bit operations. Then we have address size, the um, last one. So the processor can address either memory using a 16 or 32-bit address. The address size determines the displacement size in the instruction and the size of the address offset generated during effective address calculation. One of these sizes is designated as a default the, and the address size prefix switches between the 32-bit and the 16-bit address generation. The instruction itself includes uh, the following fields. And so now we're getting into the, the main part here the first, the opcode, the opcode field is a one, two, or three bytes in length. The opcode may include bits that specify if the data is a byte or full size, that is 16 or 32 bits, depending on the context, direction of data operation, that is to or from memory, and whether an immediate data field must be signed extended. Then there's the mod RM over here, the mod RM, this byte, and the next provide addressing information. The mod RM byte specifies whether an operand is in a register or in memory. Um, if it is in memory, then a field within the, the byte specifies the addressing mode to be used. The mod RM byte consists of three fields. The mod RM two, two bits com combines with the RM field to form a 32 possible values eight registers and 30, um, 24 indexing modes. The reg opcode field. So we're getting into the specifics here, the mod and then the reg opcode field. Um, three bits specifies either a register number or three more bits of opcode information in the RM field. Um, three bits can specify a register as a location of the operand, or it can form part of the addressing mode and encoding in, in combination with the, the mod M, the, the mod field. Okay, so we got through that. Then we have the SIB. It cont contains um, encoding of the mod RM bytes, specifies the inclusion of these, the, the SIB byte to 
specify full, fully the addressing mode, the SIB byte consists of three fields. And so even that we break up into things. And so um, there's the scale field is two bits. Um, it specifies a scale factor for, for scaling index. The, the, the index field, three, three bits specifies the index register and the, the base field, three bits specifies the, the base register. Next, we have the displacement. When the address mode specifies an indication that a displacement used, an eight, 16, or a 32 bit signed integer displacement field is used. So that's here. And then we have a media. It provides the value of an eight, 16, or a 32 bit op operand. Several comparisons may be useful here in the x86 format. The addressing mode is provided as part of an opcode sequence rather than than with each operand, because only one operand can have address mode information, only one memory operand can be referenced in an instruction. In contrast, the VAX carries the address mode information with each operand, allowing memory to memory operations. The x86 instructions are therefore more compact However, a memory to memory operation is required. The VAX can accomplish this in a, in a single instruction. The x86 format allows the use of not only one byte, but also two bytes and four byte offsets for indexing. Although the use of the larger index offsets results in longer instructions, these features provide needed flexibility. For example, it's useful in addressing large arrays of, of large stacked frames. In contrast, the IBM um, 370 instruction format allows off offset no greater than four kilobytes, that is 12 bits of offset information, and the offset must be positive. When a location is not reached, is not in reach of the offset, the, com the compiler must get extra code to generate the, the needed address. This probably is especially apparent in dealing with stack frames that have local variables occupying in excess of four kilobytes. So generating codes for the, the 370 is so painful as a result of this restriction that there have been compilers for the 370 that simply choose to limit the size of the stack frame to four kilobytes. So just an example of the, the, the penalty that came along with that. So as can be seen, the encoding of the x86 instruction set is very complex. Just notice this one chart, you can see that. This has to do partly with the need to be backward compatible with the, the 8086 machine and partly with a desire on the part of the designers to provide every possible assistance to the compiler writer in providing efficient code. It is a matter of some debate whether an instruction set as complex as this is preferable to the opposite extreme of the risk instruction set, which we see with the ARM um, processor. So now we're, we're looking at the ARM instruction format and you can notice immediately they're all the same side. They're, 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 they're 32 bits. All, this, all the ARM architecture uses 32 bit long and follows a regular format. We're seeing this in this um, slide. The first four bits of the instruction are the conditional code. As discussed in chapter 13, virtually all ARM instructions can be conditionally executed. The next three bits specify the general type of the instruction. For most instructions other than branch instruction, the next five bits constitute an opcode and or modifier bits for the operation. The, re the remaining 20 bits are the operand addressing. The, the regular structure of the instruction formats eases the job of the instruction decode units. Here's an example of the use of the ARM immediate constants. To achieve a great, greater range of immediate values, the data processing the immediate format specifies both an immediate value and a rotate value. The 8-bit immediate value is expanded to 32 bits and then rotated right by a number of bit bits equal to twice the 4-bit rotate value. Several examples are shown here in, in figure 1411. 
The thumb instruction set is a re-encoded subset of the ARM instruction set. The thumb is designed to increase the performance of ARM implementation that use a 16-bit or narrower memory data bus and to allow better code density that provide than provided by the ARM instruction set. The thumb instruction set contains a subset of the ARM 32-bit instruction and record ported into 16-bit instruction. The saving is achieved in the following way. One, thumb instructions are unconditional, so the conditional code field is not used. Also, all thumb ar arithmetic and logic instruction uh, update the condition, condition flag so that the update flag bit is not needed, saving five bits. Two, thumb has only a subset of the operations in the full instruction set and uses only a two-bit opcode field plus a, a three-bit type field saving two bits. The remaining saving of nine bit comes from reduction in the operand specification. For example, thumb instructions reference only registers R0 through R7, so only three bits are required for the register references rather than four bits. And immediate values do not include a four bit rotation field. The ARM processor can execute a program consisting of the mixture of thumb instructions and 32 bit ARM instructions. A, a, a bit in the processor control register determines which type of instruction is currently being executed. Figure 1412, which we're showing here, shows an example. The figure shows both the general format and a, a specific example, example of instruction in both 16-bit and 32-bit formats. With the instruction of the thumb instruction set, the user was required to, to, to blend instruction sets by compiling uh, performance, critical, um, performance critical code to ARM and, and the rest to thumb. This manual code blended requirements a, a additional effort and it is difficult to achieve. Um, so it's difficult to achieve optimal results. To overcome these problems, ARM developed the uh, Thumb 2 instruction set, which is the only instruction set available on the Cortex-M microcontroller products. The Thumb 2 is a major enhancement to the Thumb instruction set architecture, that is the ISA. It introduces 32-bit instructions that can be intermixed freely with the older 16-bit Thumb instructions. These new 32-bit instructions cover almost all the functionality ARM instruction set. The most important difference between the Thumb ISA and the ARM ISA is that most 32-bit Thumb instructions are unconditional, whereas almost all ARM instructions can be conditional. However, Thumb 2 in introduces a new if-then, that is IT instruction that delivers much of the functionality of the conditional field in the ARM instruction. Thumb 2 delivers over all code density comparable with thumb together with the performance levels associated with the ARM ISI, ISA. Before Thumb 2, developers had to choose between thumb for size and ARM for performance. There have been reports on the analysis of the Thumb 2 instruction set compared with the ARM and original thumb instruction sets. The analysis involved compiling and executing the embedded microcompositor micro processor and batch consortium um, benchmark suite using the three instru instruction sets in the with the following results. With compilers optimized for the performance, Thumb 2 size was 26% smaller than ARM and slightly larger than the original Thumb. With compilers optimized for space, Thumb 2 size was 32% smaller than ARM and only slightly smaller than the original Thumb. With compilers optimized for performance, the Thumb 2 performance on the benchmark suite was 98% of the uh, ARM performance and 125% of the original Thumb performance. These results confirm that Thumb 2 meets its design objectives. So we have that as a possible excursion. 
Here um, we have our last chart before we do our summary. The figure 13, 14, 13 shows how the new 32-bit thumb instructions are encoded. The encoding is compatible with the existing thumb unconditional branch instruction, which has the, the bit pattern 11100 in the five leftmost bits of the instruction. No other 16-bit instruction begins with the, the pattern 111 in the, the three leftmost bits. So the bit pattern 11101, 11110, and 11111 indicates that this is a 32-bit thumb instruction. Okay, so now we've gotten a better sense for the instruction sets focusing on the addressing modes and formats. We talked about a variety of different type of formatting, immediate, direct, indirect, register, register, indirect, displacement, and stack. I think probably the best way to get a, a better sense of this is by doing some practice coding, um, assembly language coding, and we'll get a chance to be doing some of that in class and with our assignments. We also talked about the addressing modes, both for the x86 and the ARM. We also talked about the instruction formats, talking about the length. The x86 and other systems have variable length. The um, classical way for ARM is it has a fixed length. We then got into the formats for the x86 and also for the ARM. Okay, well, that will finish it for today for, for this lecture. Thank you.